All right, guys, welcome to season two. C's get degrees. We have Nate Dukes on the other end here. Welcome, brother. Hey, thanks for having me. Man. I love your podcast and your show, and I'm so excited to be here, man. It's a ball of energy, ain't it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's a lot of fun, and there's a lot of passion. There's a lot of heart. There's a lot of great stories. And I'm just pumped up to talk to you today about what I've been doing and hearing what you've been up to in your world. So this is going to be great. It's going to be an improv session, man. So we could throw whatever you want on the table. Obviously, I have a few things on my checklist here. You know, we'll, we'll kind of brief in this podcast. Um, but yeah, it, I don't want to call it a free for all. There's a little script, guys. All right. So all you listeners, I do have notes next to me. But what I love about improv is the emotions that we get when we turn that mic on. Absolutely. It just comes out natural and how the message is supposed to be. It's not pre-scripted, whatever. So um, the reason why both of us want to connect is um, you have a past story. That's pretty much pretty parallel to mine, except for, you know, one, a few things, but the bulk of the, the things a lot more parallel to what mind is. And like we were discussing right before we jumped on here and I did the tag, um, <laughs> we did not go to school for this guys. And, and uh, we've been completely blessed to get 180 degree turn with our story. And uh, dig deep, man. The mic's yours. Yeah. Um, so you're absolutely right. I was on, when I was in high school, we grew up and I was the, we were the poor family growing up. We were the poor kids. We were used to handouts. I remember one Christmas, my mom said to me, she said, Hey, listen, Nate, don't plan on having a whole lot of presents underneath the Christmas tree this year. And you know, as a kid, that's never anything you want to hear. Right. But there was this incredible church that blessed us and, and they came up and they, they, they went and bought my mom Christmas presents. And there wasn't just gifts underneath the tree, but they were all over the house. But as a kid, you start to ask yourself this question, where did all this stuff come from? Because now I have these unhealthy mindsets and I don't blame my parents at all. They were really kids trying to raise other kids and they were just trying to figure it out. But when they had unhealthy mindsets, they got passed down to me. And so now I'm starting to ask myself these questions of like, how am I ever going to get out of here? When is my life going to look any different? Is there going to be enough money to go around? And so when I went away to college for the very first time, I knew that I wanted to make some changes with my life. I saw this as an opportunity to do something different with my life. And so I wanted to start to become a person who I wasn't in high school. But here's the problem. When I went away to college, I got introduced to drugs and alcohol for the very first time. And I'll be honest with you, man. I had a great time. It was a whole lot of fun. Okay. And, and I went to college for four years and I felt like for the first time I had a personality, I was making new friends, but I never graduated. And, and so I didn't come home with a degree, but I, I did come home with a master's in, in how to have a really good time. And maybe you understand what I'm talking about. Oh, I know. I know a lot of time I came home with a degree, but I probably had a doctorate on how to have a good time <laughs> at college. Yeah. So I, I, I actually got kicked out of college because I drank too much and then uh, kind of got slipped back in. So no, no, we're smiling, man. Keep going. So I, I came home uh, after four years and I moved back in with mom and dad. And, and let's, let's be honest, that's the real walk of shame, okay? Moving back in with your parents is something that you really don't want to do, but they welcomed me back in. And, and so now I'm trying to figure out what do I want to do with my life? And so I then became a bartender at a bar and it, it really started to scratch this party itch that I had going on. And, and eventually I got connected with a buddy of mine who wanted to open up his own bar and I stepped into that. And all of a sudden now I'm a business owner at, in my early twenties. I I've got this, this uh, uh, interest in drugs because I've, I've experimented a little bit, but I've, I've also started to, to experience a little bit of success as well. And so they're, they're kind of going hand in hand. The dr my drug of choice was, um, uh, ADD medicine. So, so Adderall, anything that I could get me going and, and make me focused. And the problem was, is that I wasn't just using it correctly. I, I started to, to abuse it and take, um, not just my own prescription that I had gotten from a, that, that was my first drug dealer, by the way, a guy wearing a white coat. Um, but then I started to buy my friend's prescriptions. And so now I'm using three, four, five times the amount that I should be. And I'm staying up for days at a time. But 
on the other end, this business is really starting to take off and it's starting to become successful. And, and so now that I've reached this pinnacle of success, I have the car, I have the apartment, I'm able to get girls for the first time in my life. And I feel like this is what's supposed to make me happy, but I'm still empty on the inside. And so now I've got to figure out what is going to fill this hole inside of me. And so it's, it's not the drugs, it's not the success, it's not the party lifestyle. So now I start to gamble. I start to try and figure out what can I, where, where's the next high that I can chase. And over the course of a year, I ended up gambling everything that I owned away. And my, so my bank accounts were, were at zero. But the thing about having access to a business bank account is that even though yours might be empty, the business is still has some in it. And I don't, I'm not proud of this decision that I made, but I started taking money from the business bank account. I didn't see it as stealing. I figured, man, I'm a part owner of this business. It's, it's my money anyways. But that was just a, a broken way of looking at things. And, and one of the lowest moments of my life is when it was a Friday, we had 20 employees who worked for us. And my partner came up to me and he said, hey, Nate, it's time to cut the checks for payroll. And I just came clean and I said, listen, hey, brother, if we write these checks, there's not going to be any money in the accounts to cover them. And he was confused. He didn't understand. And then finally, it started to catch up to him. He realized that I'd taken the money the night before and that all of the payroll money and gambled it all away. And so now I'm at this place where I'm, I'm starting to hit my rock bottom. And so I'm, I move once again back home with my mom and dad and uh, I can barely hold down a job. I get a job. Uh, I still dealing with this drug and gambling addiction. I'd steal from the cash register. I get caught, then I get fired. And I repeated that three different times. And finally, one of the lowest points in my life, I'm walking around my parents' apartment complex, just took a handful of pills. It's 3 a.m. And I'm walking to different vehicles, trying to see if any of them are unlocked to see if I could find something inside, see if there's anything I could sell. And I, I opened the car door to one of the unlocked cars I lift up the console and inside the console was a spare key to this car. And in my mind, I'm thinking, this is my shot to get away from it all. This is my opportunity to run away from all of my problems. And so I steal this 1999 Buick LeSabre. Now in retrospect, if you're going to steal a car, okay, go for the new hotness. Okay. You do not have to go for the old and busted, but I found myself in this place where if you don't know what kind of mindset you're in and you're in the wrong place, you never know what could happen. And so I packed up five garbage bags of clothes, threw them in the backseat of the car, and I headed for Houston, Texas, where I knew I had a buddy that would just give me a place to stay. So I just wanted to start my life over. I made it about halfway right outside of Houston, Texas. And uh, I was sleeping at a gas station after being up for three days. And I just wanted to get some rest before I finished the rest of my journey. And I was woken up at 9 a.m. to the sounds of banging on the window, the car door opening, a stranger's hand reached in, pulled me out of the car, threw me on the ground, put me in handcuffs, and threw me in the back of his cop car. And that's when this thought started replaying over and over in my mind. You're never going to change. This is who you are. You've messed your life up. And so now I'm headed to Cheatham County Jail in Ashland City, Tennessee, where I spent six months of my life. And while I was there, I had a pretty profound moment. I had like this spiritual awakening, this moment with God. And, and I also gave me an opportunity to, to start to ask myself these questions. Who do I want to be? Because I know this is not the life that I wanted to live. And so when I got out of jail, my little sister, she was 21 years old. She could have said anything to me. Hey, big brother, do you want to go grab a drink? Do you want to go party? You want to go do anything after being in a box for six months? You just want to experience experience life again. And she says, Hey, do you want to go to church with me? And I said, well, no, <laughs> she goes, well, it's better than anything else that you're doing right now. So why don't you give it a shot? And she was right, man. So I went to this church. It wasn't like any church that I had ever been to before, but these people there, even though I was a mess, they were willing to get messy with me. And I started to really make some new friends. I got into a new environment. I started to change my mindset and I started to work at the beginning stages of making my own comeback. And now years later, my life looks nothing like what it used to. But it's not because I'm any good. It's because I really surrendered my life to God, but I decided that I was going to put in the hard work. And now one of the great joys of my life is I get to speak on stages, both virtually, but also in person. I've taken 18 months and I've written this book, which is a passion project for me. But really what I love is I get to walk guys through their own comeback story. 
guys and girls who have, are starting at the bottom, which by the way, if you're at the bottom right now, or you're feeling hopeless or worthless, or you feel like, Hey, I don't have any self-confidence right now. The bottom is a beautiful place to be. It gives you an opportunity to really, you get to choose where you want to go from here. And so I help people start from the bottom, create their comeback and prove those negative voices wrong. Yeah. 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 I'm, I can't even answer this one right now. The reasoning for it is I've been at the bottom. Yeah. I know exactly what you feel because I pretty much taking the whole bottle of alcohol in front of your family and getting family shamed is the best way of saying it. And now in the journey, I'm about a year and a half into it, pretty much Memorial Day. So we're recording this, what, a week before Memorial Day, week or two. I'm going to answer this question. I'm going to ask you this question because you're in this and it's starting to creep up now where people are starting to reach out to me. So I'm, I'm in that journey where it's like, okay, guys, you know, I'm an open book. I'll show you what it is. Am I in that it did for me, whatever it was, people to connect. Can you now look look at the people that are kind of in these binges and be like, okay, bro, you need some help. Absolutely. And this is why one of my best friends in the world who also comes from an addiction background, he says it like this. He says, because I've been in the darkness, I now have the ability, but also the responsibility to help other people out of that darkness. And so I can go into places that people will never go. I can speak into situations that some people will never be able to speak into. It's because of the life experiences that I've had. It's because of the pain that I have gone through. It is because now on the other side of it, I have the ability to show people and give them to be a light in the dark place for those around me. But I also have the credibility now because I've been doing it for long enough that I have a proven track record that if you listen to some of the things that I'm saying, you can start to make your own comeback. It's not about me, man. I'm not just interested in my story. I'm interested in seeing an impact. How can your story be changed? And then your story affects somebody else's story. And we see this beautiful ripple effect of life change, literally because you made the decision to get your life together. I remember this blatantly. And this occurred six months ago. And this is a person that got their life together. And I will tell you this right now, and I'm not going to say her name. I'm going to keep her off the air here. We were meeting each other, whatever it is, thinking about dating, whatever it is. And she turned to me. She's like, hey, I'm having issues with it. Um, I want to clean up, whatever it is. And blatantly, and I, this is word for word, I told her, I said, getting sober is going to be the hardest thing in your life to do. And she's like, what? And I looked at her. I said, you're going to have to have one hell of a backbone because if you have 12 friends, 10 of them are going to go away. Yeah. Secondly, your whole life's going to flip upside down and you have to be mentally, not say mentally fit, but you're going to be getting ready for battle because people are going to come after you. So the intro of my book is like my love letter to the reader. It's I do a whole lot of encouraging, but also I say that your comeback is going to require a whole lot of work. And I ask the, I pose this question, is this going to work? And then I say, for some of you, probably not. Because not everybody is ready to accept the fact that they are responsible for the decisions that they make. They're not ready to go on this journey of real hard work. I know it's cliche. I know it sounds so cliche right now, but it requires a massive amount of effort on your part. Because of the decisions we've made, we now have to work two and three times harder than other people for the same opportunity. And so when people come up to me and say, you know, you don't get it. It's unfair. I don't A, B, C, D. I get it. I know. You have to work harder. You're going to have, they don't have to work as hard as I, I know you're going to have to work harder. Yeah, yeah. I'm in the best shape of my life. I work the hardest shape of my life and I don't like physically job wise. It is mentally guys. If you look at my job versus my mental attack, I am working so hard to give us our mental state. And it's the same thing with you. You have to be mentally stable to have people come up and say, Hey, you want to drink? No. You know, the situation that occurred last night. Hey, I wish you could have a beer with us. Hey, man, I would love to, but I can't. You know, it's like, I know I can't quit. Uh, situation last week when I was talking to my own mother, uh, she's like, 
why are you stu- not stuttering? But it's like, why are you kind of weird? Whatever it is. I'm like, I'm wondering if I'm going through a patch where my brain's starting to heal itself again. Yeah. And I looked at her. I said, here's the deal. I had to strip everything away and learn how to do it all over again, sober. And, well, and, and you're absolutely right. You are relearning how to do things. And we've heard this quote before that we are the sum total of the five people that we do life with. And so if that's true, we now have the responsibility to take an inventory of the people around us and say, am I willing to trade places with them? Because if, I, if I'm not, if I don't like the direction that they're heading in, why am I allowing them to invest their voice in my life? Because the voices in my life will dictate the choices that I make in my life. And so when I say this to people, they say, uh, Nate, what, what are you telling me? I, I got to get rid of some of my friends. I got to give up some relationships. And the hard truth is, yes, for some of you, this is the permission that you need right now to walk away from that toxic relationship. I know they are your boo-boo right now. And I know it's so fun being cuddled up with them, but they are pulling you in a direction that you were never meant to go in in the first place. And you're going to look back in your life a year, a year or two years from now and say, I wasted all of that time. It's going to be painful to cut it off now, but it's going to be worth it on the back end. The people that don't know my backstory, your backstory, I had to move out of my house, which was my parents. So I was in the same situation as you get them, get out of a door, go crawl into a bottle, live at your parents, because obviously you got to crawl in a bottle, get over what happened in the past relationship. I moved out. I went to a town where I thought there'd be all kinds of entertainment prior because I wasn't that what happened was I came up in lockdown I went on two to ten which when you work two to ten it eliminates all your entertainment and I work six days a week if not seven and then I threw all my podcast stuff whatever it is in there so I overworked myself so I don't have to think about it. obviously I'm you have to go through that there's a gray area guys okay the first zero to six months to nine months you have to physically do whatever it is and your means get your mind off it if that means going to church you know whatever it is you have to have your mind off it yeah and so it's it's so easy to get caught up in my surroundings and look at everything around me and say well i'll I'll get it together when i get enough money or when this relationship works out or when i get a better job or and when you stop focusing on your surroundings and start focusing on yourself That's when things can really start to change for you. You know, the most important relationship for me is my relationship with God. But the second one is the relationship that I have with myself. And I had to take a moment where I sat down with a version of me that I didn't like. And that was the past version of me. I had to look at past Nate. I look him in the mirror and dude, I got real with him. I I cussed him out a little bit. And I said, you suck. And I was mad, bro. I was mad at who he was. And, and I was so upset because if he would have never messed up, our life wouldn't look what it looks like right now. But I looked him in the mirror and I said, Nate, with all your flaws, with everything you've done wrong, I still love you. But more importantly, I forgive you. And I can't help but wonder what some of our lives would look like if we looked at ourselves in the mirror and we forgave ourselves for some of the mistakes that we've made in our life. And then I had to look at a present version of myself when nobody believed in me yet. So I looked at present Nate and I said, I know that you've made some changes that nobody can see yet. Nobody believes in you, but I do. And I started to coach myself. I started to encourage myself. I started to build myself up. And that's when I started to build some trust with myself because then I looked at future Nate and this was a great conversation. I said, I'm going to do whatever it takes to give you the life that you deserve. If that means starting from the bottom, if that means building this thing brick by brick, if that means getting in the mud and the mess of my own life, having uncomfortable conversations. Tim Ferriss says it like this. Everything we want in life is on the other side of an uncomfortable conversation. I'm willing to do whatever it takes to give you the life that we deserve. And so I started to build this Uh, consistency, this credibility, but this trust with myself. And so now I'm a person, when I say I'm going to do something, I do it. And have you ever had somebody come up to you who, you know, they've come and they've shared this dream or this idea or this goal, or they they, they just tell you they're going to do something. And in the whole time, you're kind of just shaking your head. Yes. But in the back of your head, you're thinking, yeah, that ain't ever going to happen. 
it's because they don't have any credibility built up with you. They're, they're not a credible person. And so how do you create credibility? Well, you do it through creating trust by keeping your promises to yourself, by being a person who does what they say that they're going to do. And so when you do that with yourself, you build this credibility and trust with yourself. And now you can have self-confidence. Now I can be a person who is confident with who I am because I love me. I forgive me. I encourage me, but I also trust myself. And so I just really want to encourage somebody out there. If you're having this tough moment, if you're having this place where I don't have, I feel like I'm starting at the bottom. I, where do I start? It starts with, yeah, you got to have a vision. Yes. You need to make the right decisions, but it really starts with doing the internal work. John Maxwell says, if I want my world to change, I've got to be the one that changes first. There's your tip for relationship, guys. Don't change your partner, change yourself first. Yeah, so, absolutely. Be- oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, 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 you're absolutely right. This is a great vein because you will die on the hill of trying to change somebody else. Yes. You can't change anybody else. <laughs> you can hardly change yourself. What makes you think you're going to be able to change another person? You can't. You can't. You have to. This is a reason, and the listeners that know me know me well. I've been single for many, I want to say three years. If I'm not, let me word it properly. I need to make sure I'm happy first. Yes. And I'm going through everything to make sure I am perfectly happy on the inside. Love what I do. Wake up what I do. All Whatever it is, make sure my relationship with God is great. Whoever wants to come in and enjoy that ride, come on in. But I have these foundations lined up first that not to be selfish or nothing, but I have to take care of me first. You're no good to anybody if you're empty on the inside. Exactly. You're actually doing that person a disservice by being the person that God didn't create you to be. If you're still broken and you enter into a relationship, you will take these um, broken mindsets. You'll bring them into a relationship. You'll call them relationship issues. And then you'll look at that person and say, well, because you're not making me happy, you must not be the one. You didn't have relationship issues. You had single people problems that you brought into a relationship and now it's crumbling right before your eyes. So you are doing the exact right thing by focusing on yourself, becoming the man that God has created you. Instead of trying to find Mrs. Right, you're becoming Mr. Right, which is the most powerful thing that you can do. I'm enjoying the ride, man. And uh, I'm going to, we're going to end it here because you just gave us a whole line of gold. So, okay. I know we got a book coming out. So tell everyone where the book's coming and then where we can find you on social media. Yeah. So it's on Amazon right now, but if you want to go to my website and it'll redirect you to Amazon, it's you'll never change.com. And you can find me on social media on Instagram at who is Nate Dukes. Same thing with Facebook at who is Nate Dukes. But my real passion isn't, I would love it if you got a copy of the book, but I believe that there are guys and gals in recovery and rehab centers all across America right now who don't need another handout, but they need to be inspired. They need to be resourced and they need to be taught how to change. And so what I've developed is this, um, I've developed this program where you can pay it forward. It's an initiative where you can partner with me, buy a book for someone that you've never met before at a reduced rate. And I will personally go to different recovery centers all across the United States that I partner with right now and share my story, give them a free copy of the book, and you will be a part of inspiring somebody else's comeback. And you can find that at you'll never change.com slash pay it forward. Awesome, man. 